Welcome back to the Deliberate Leaders Podcast. I am your host and executive business coach, Allison Dunn. Our guest today is Shara Roman. She is an author, speaker, and the founder and CEO of the Silverine Group, a consulting firm that aligns people, strategy, and culture to optimize organizational performance. Shara, thank you so much for joining us today. Allison, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. I love to kick these off with a deliberate conversation. What would be your number one leadership tip for our listeners today? Yes. Um, my number one tip for leaders, um, well, really anyone listening, is uh, to be curious. And I think curiosity is important um, because that allows us to be open-minded, that uh, allows us to sort of lean into, uh, you know, sort of questioning and learning more and exploring more about uh, an individual or a situation. And I find that, you know, oftentimes um, leaders who have moved up the organization have often moved up because they're an expert in a particular thing. And so they always, I shouldn't say always, they often feel like they know the answer. And so they're less likely to sort of um, dig deeper and explore that there might be more than one answer that is the, the right way to go or, or a good way to go. Um, and I think it just helps to to impact kind of the relationships that you have with the people that you work with, that you that they're in your lives and in your community. So I think curiosity is uh, is the one tip I would share. I love that. Curiosity is one of my core values personally, and I think it's the answer to absolutely everything um, <laughs> in making great connections with people, right? Like, you know, if I may not agree, but I'm like super curious, why do you think that just to better understand? So like such a great tip. I love that. Yeah. The um, the topic of our uh, podcast today is also the title of Shara's book, which is The Conscious Workplace, Fortifying Your Culture to Thrive in Any Crisis. And um, I think that that is a really important topic. Um, and you brought up a point in your book as to why you are the, you're only as happy as your least happy employee. And I want you to, to share more about that under the concept of conscious leader. Yes. So we, you know, we've all heard, uh, you know, the, the old adage of sort of one rotten apple spoils the barrel, right? And, um, you know, if you think about the fact that certainly pre-pandemic, we all work together in a workplace or often work together in a workplace. Um, and our, our moods are contagious, how we, how we show up, how we think, Right. And so if someone is uh, and I, I realize now we're not all in the workplace together, some of some companies have come back, some are hybrid, some are fully virtual, whatever. It doesn't really matter that energy that that person brings that that sort of visual look, the, the, the sort of the feeling that they have, the um, even the way they carry themselves. Right. That all just comes through. And so there can be, you know, unhappiness that they're unhappy with their um, with with their job. They're unhappy with their manager. They're unhappy with something going on in their lives. Could be that they're unhappy because they're not being included, because they're not being um, their their natural talents and gifts aren't sort of tapped into. Whatever that reason is for cure, causing that unhappiness, uh, I think as leaders in an organization, we really need to lean into that. Sort of going back to my 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 sort of tip around curiosity. Like, why is that person unhappy? Don't make assumptions. Don't make, um, don't sort of jump to conclusions because ultimately if they're unhappy, that is going to spread uh, and create sort of a, a dip in your morale for everybody because it might be that other people have to step in and do work that they're not doing because they're unhappy and not, not doing it. They're unhappy because they don't know how to do it. They're unhappy because they're thinking about their, you know, their, their sick parent whatever that situation is, right? It, um, like I said, it does impact everyone. So I think it's incumbent on us to, as leaders to really um, figure out what's going on for folks and how we can help them uh, really leverage their strengths and sort of be their full selves and really create that space for them to 
contribute in ways that allow them to be innovative and cre uh, creative, because oftentimes that is sort of that cure, quote unquote, for, for them being unhappy. Right. Um, is it is it okay for a leader to specifically, while trying to seek understanding of maybe what's going on, actually point out um, the impact that it's having on everyone else after or first so that there's an open conversation about it? I think part of it just depends on the relationship you have with the person, right? But I, I think it's important to be transparent and not to sort of dance around and sort of pretend like you're just asking a question in a disingenuous way. So, you know, it could go something like, hey, Allison, I've, I've noticed that, um, uh, you know, you, you don't seem to be yourself. Um, or, um, hey, Allison, I wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, some of the work that you've been, you've been delivering. Let's sort of talk about, you know, some of the, the, the mistakes that I've been seeing or the lateness. And, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about what might be going on for you? Um, you know, or it could be a very direct, hey, Allison, I've noticed your demeanor has changed lately. You know, um, is there anything you'd like to talk to me about? Is there any way I can help you? Um, is there anything that we can take off your plate? You know, what's going on for you? I think being straight up and direct is is usually the best way, as long as you're kind as well, right? Right, for sure. Um, when when uh, when we have um, team members that are in an environment working in an office together, there's a lot of assumptions that go with maybe how they're showing up with their energy. Quiet quitting is one of the ones that I know is discussed a lot. What are your tips around not judging that as the as the ultimate answer, but then also like how to ensure that that's not what the underlying action is that's being taken? Um, so let me just try to understand your question that we are sort of facing that, that sort of scenario of quiet quitting and, and then what was the second part well, of the, I think part of it is you don't assume that that's what it is. And then how do you, how do you engage oh. them to ensure that you're moving them if they're heading in that direction out of that? Right. So I look at quiet quitting and I know there's, there's been a lot of talk around this as essentially sort of a new name for people that are disengaged in their, in their work. Right. So there's. There's right. that unhappiness piece and the unhappiness can be um, point in time, right? Or it could be this sort of longer um, thing that's been going on that has now really caused an employee to be, to be disengaged and to sort of quiet quit. Um, I think it goes back to, you know, it, and then there's a the quiet firing and the quiet hiring and, and all this sort of quiet stuff that's happening, which is very much just under the radar and not sort of being really upfront and intentional and, and engaging with the people that, that you're working with. And so, you know, if you're noticing that there is a pattern, there's a shift in how that person is showing up, the kind of work that they're contributing, I think it goes back to having a conversation around, around it. I also think that there is a bit of a mindset shift that needs to, um, that needs to happen in that, the traits that we valued, you know, 40, 50 years ago, even 20 and 30 years ago, when I came into the workforce are not the traits that are valued in by today's workforce. And we are not going to be able to lead organizations still expecting people to um, show us FaceTime and sort of work themselves to the bone, right? You know, put in 60 hours, putting 60, 70 hours a week is not a badge of honor. It's actually like, what's wrong with you that you can't manage your work um, in that time? And why aren't we having conversations that are bigger around um, the way the work is structured, the way that we've got hierarchy or lack of hierarchy in the organization, like what's really causing all of that? So it goes back to, um, you know, not making assumptions about someone, not calling them lazy, not sort of saying, oh, well, I knew I shouldn't have hired this person because they didn't have the qualifications, right? But it's really trying to dig under and, and say, why is this? And is this happening with just one person on my team? Or is this really a pervasive issue, which is even more dangerous, right? Uh, potentially that, that, that this uh, lack of engagement is now sp is now spreading or has spread across my across my team. 
-hmm. You uh, brought up a very important point that I think under this particular topic is that there's um, there's been a shift, but there's also all these different generations that are reflected in the workforce right now. And our work styles, like I bring with me my industrial era, you know, work styles, because that's the way I was raised. I was raised in a manufacturing, not literally, but practically in a family owned manufacturing company. And so it was shift work. It was you punch in, you punch out, you, you know, do second shift, you do, you know, all the things that are needed to work yourself to the bone. Right. So that's my work ethic and things have changed. What guidance would you give to someone listening who may have a, um, a different view of, uh, uh, work value than maybe their leader and, or someone they report to? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I know it can be a really hot topic, right? And so what I say to people is, um, listen, back in the eighties and nineties, we used fax machines to communicate information, right? We couldn't even imagine a smartphone, right? We couldn't even imagine a cell phone, let alone a smartphone. And the fact that these Apple or Google or whatever Android devices that we hold have more power than, than some of the computers. So it's sort of leaning into that, you know, kind of that, that curious mindset again, to sort of say, um, just be open to the fact the world has changed. And just like we're not using fax machines anymore, and we're not using phones that have a landline with the little curly cord attached to the receiver, right? And all of those technological advances, let's just appreciate and, and sort of be open to the idea that people work differently, that people um, view the work world in a different way. And that actually, you know, working ourselves to the bone, so to speak, for, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours, whatever that might've been for the last several decades um, has really led to a crisis of burnout mm -hmm. in this country and, and across the world, but that we now are seeing kind of the, the, the side effects, right. Or the actually not even the side effects, the, the actual effects mm -hmm. of all of that. And so this burnout is not just coming from COVID and, and people sort of, you know, being trapped at home and sort of working, working hours. It's really come from a systemic way of thinking about our work. And um, I would just say, you know, invite yourself to think about it a little differently. Maybe get more engaged with the people on your team that come from different generations, both those that are, you know, from older generations and younger generations. Uh, I think that the way we teach students these days is different, right? The way we um, the way we get to work is different. So all of these other things have changed around us, and so we can't expect that um, with the world changing, with um, just our communities, our environment, all of that changing, that we would that people would would do work in exactly the same way and have that same work work ethic. And there's not just one work ethic that is the right work ethic. You know, I think we just need to be open to to that. So I would I would say talk to people and understand what they're coming what they're coming from and at the end of the day if you're just if you're measuring work based on what are your outputs and are you delivering what I need to be delivered? Why do you then care? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that's an important and a very important point to make. Um, so just talking about culture and um creating an inclusive feeling inside of a culture, um, what are some of the things that you believe um our different generations need to provide that? Yeah, so you know, in terms of making um uh, people feel included, you, you know, the, the Gen Zs, which are your 25, 26 year olds, maybe, and sort of younger, right? They're, they're the ones that are just coming into the workforce. We have to remember that they are tech native. Um, I sort of like to joke that they were born with, you know, an iPad in their hands, right? They, they know how to sort of manipulate those things. They know how to search for information. They're incredibly resourceful and incredibly um, resilient. And so when they have a question, um, they go to Google. In fact, I, I tell the story often, my daughter was about 12 years old 
And um, she had been sort of texting me all day saying, I, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I really need to talk to you. Um, I'm, I'm having some issues and we need to talk. So of course I had all these things that are going through my, my head, like what, what is going on, right? Imagining the worst. And I get home and she's like, well, um, I think I'm lactose intolerant and I have been doing research and I was, I've been tracking my symptoms and um, I, you know, I searched on Google and I went to WebMD and I went here and I went there and I sort of correlated my symptoms with what I've read. And I sort of was like, wait, what just happened, right? You're 12. You're supposed to come to your mom and say, hey, I'm not feeling well, mommy. Can, you know, can you help me? And then I'm supposed to call the doctor, make an appointment and go there. And yet she had done all this research by herself to figure it out. And I share that because. Um, and lo and behold, she actually is lactose intolerant, right? And we did all the testing. But the point is that um, these, this, this generation of, of Zs in particular um, know how to find information. And they have tons of things coming at them through TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and whatever else, their, their Snapchat, whatever else they're on. So we have to recognize that. And um, and and realize that the way they learn, the way they work is going to be very different. And if we sort of put ourselves in their shoes and realize sort of what they have, we can appreciate that they are not going to want to be told what to do. They're not going to be told um, how to do what needs to be done. And they need to be given some latitude, right, to be able to do that. Um, the same goes for for millennials who are also very tech savvy, maybe not as tech native as as the Z's, right? But those folks are at the top end in their mid forties, and they're in leadership roles. And so we again need to recognize that the way they lead is different, but doesn't mean that it's wrong. And so we need to give them room to sort of be themselves, lean into their leadership styles, lean into their work styles, let them make mistakes. If it is a mistake, let them learn from that mistake and use that as opportunities for, for discussion for, hey, what, what went well? What could we have changed, right? As opposed to imposing the same, sort of the same way of doing something that may or may not be the, the, the way to do it. Um, in, in today's world. So it's just having that, that lens. And on the, on the flip side, if you're a younger manager, right, you're a millennial, let's say, and you have a baby boomer who's working for you and isn't so tech savvy. Um, and I'm making really gross stereotypes here, right? But, or maybe they're, they're not understanding, um, you know, why, you um, you know, you're expecting something in a, in a particular way, it might be, well, hey, let's pair you up with someone who can reverse mentor you, right? And maybe coach you and teach you something new. And that's a great skill that you can use to, to take with you wherever you go. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just being, um, it's being open, it's being curious, it's being, um, uh, it, it's sort of giving people space, uh, the psychological safety to, to learn, to grow, to, to make those mistakes and, um, and recognize that there's many different ways to, to do things. Yeah. Okay. In, um, in your book, you also talk about why diversity, equity, inclusion aren't enough, um, unless they're paired with belonging and empowerment. Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I like to say that diversity is a fact and inclusion is an act. And I like that. Yeah. So we can make a decision to have diversity, right? And, and yet, and I was just talking to someone actually at lunch today who said that she got what she thought was her dream job. And um, the whole time she was there, she felt incredibly awkward. Mm -hmm. because she was the only black woman in that organization. And so it might have been diversity. I mean, one person is not really diversity, right? But it was one individual. And, um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a fact. The act of inclusion is actually sort of leaning into some of those behaviors. Mm -hmm. But when you create a culture of belonging, you're really sort of creating that space of psychological safety, right? That I sort of mentioned earlier, where you can make mistakes, where you 
do feel included, where you can be yourself. So, you know, think about back in the, what, in the early, I guess, 2000s, when millennials started to come into the workforce and had tattoos. And back in the day, certainly when, when I grew up, if you had a tattoo, which first of all, you never would, right? Like if you had a tattoo, you were never going into a corporate job, you would cover it up, right? And now it's show your tattoos, right? Flaunt them, they're, they're, they're art, such a big mindset shift. And so when you're, when you're feeling like you belong, you aren't going to cover up your tattoos. You aren't going to change the way you do your hair. You're not going to dress differently, right? You're going to be able to talk in the dialect that you want to talk in, all of those types of things. So you have to have, you know, the diversity is sort of bringing the people in into the organization. The inclusion is sort of the act of, of some behaviors. The belonging is really creating that psychological safety for people to, to be who they are, to make those mistakes, to to learn, to grow, to contribute, to, to ask questions, to not to be penalized because they said the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person, right? And then the empowerment, at the end of the day, we are all autonomous beings. I mean, even two-year-olds want to be able to tie their own shoelaces, right? They want to be able to pick out their own clothes. They want to be able to feed themselves. And so that autonomy doesn't disappear as we get older, it just gets stronger. And so this, the idea of empowerment is fostering ownership across your, uh, across the, across your organization, the people that are working with you. And ownership doesn't have to be, you know, stock options or an employee stock ownership plan or some sort of monetary ownership. Certainly that's one element of ownership, but ownership comes in, how do I make decisions? Can I make a decision, right? It comes in, how do I do this work? When do I do this work? What does the final product sort of look like? Um, yes, you're given you're given some boundaries of, hey, it's due by X date, and you know you, we need to have three of these. But then the rest of it you can kind of figure out on your on your own, right? So you really, if you can foster, if you can bring in diverse people, if you can start to inculcate inclusive behaviors, and then you really lean into what does that belonging look like? And then how do I really empower my people to do what they do best and not pigeonhole them because of their education or lack of education? That's what's really gonna create thriving um, organizations. Um, at the beginning of this interview, um, you kind of made a correlation that maybe I thought of it that way, but I haven't heard. So you said, Quiet quitting is basically the new way to say disengaged. And so um, you also brought up in your book, um, are your employees simply happy in their roles or have they entered into the early stages of quiet quitting? And I guess I would like for you to give some tips on how do you tell the difference and how do you re-engage in, not how do you re-engage them, but how do you know when they need to be re-engaged or engaged? Yeah, I think when you start to see, you know, a drop off in the quality of work, mm -hmm. the drop off in um, maybe even the quantity of work, mm -hmm. the drop off in sort of raising your hand to sort of say, hey, I'll take that on um, a shift in mood, a shift in behavior, a shift in maybe not asking questions, right? If that, especially if that person is um, someone who does like to ask a lot of questions a shift in being quiet, those are all signals. When someone is not behaving the way they normally behave, that should be sending a, a signal up to managers to say, what's going on here, right? And that is a bit of a challenge because we've created organizations where managers quite candidly have way too much on their plates, mm -hmm. right? They're individual contributors and um, they've got their own bunch of work <laughs> that they need to do. And then on top of it, they have five, six, 10, however many it is people that they have to manage. And this people management job is this job that happens on the side of, of, their, of their job. So that is just not a fair situation that managers are put in, which makes it very hard to really get to know their people and then to get to know the signals uh, of, of when something is different, right? But it's, it's, um, we do need to figure that out, but that is what I would, would say to a manager is that you've really got to know your folks and you've really got to know um, how they operate, how they tick, 
what motivates them, what inspires them. And when some of that stuff starts to shift, then you, then you know, Hey, wait a second, something is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sometimes people physically come into a meeting with, you know, red eyes because they've been crying, right? Mm -hmm. That should be like a huge signal, not in the meeting to say, Hey, you know, why, why do your eyes look like that? Sure. <laughs> but, but to, le to, to have that conversation with them. So, you know, tips to, to, to re-engage or sort of tips to sort of, um, uh, it, it goes back to sort of asking questions, you know, how are you, what's going on? Um, you know, what can we do to help you? Um, uh, you, you know, you can also do a stay interview, um, which is, you know, sort of prepare a set of questions that you can ask that, hey, how do you really, you know, how are things going with your job? What are things I could be doing better for you as your manager? Um, what's the most fun project that you worked on recently? Um, you know, if, if you could sort of design your most ideal week, what would that look like next week? I mean, those are different questions that you can start to ask to get people to open up and, and start to talk, right? And if, if they really have to think about the most fun project they worked and they don't have an answer for you, that should be a clue, right? That, wait a second, if this person hasn't been having fun with their work, what's going on, you know? Um, so those are the types of things I would, I would suggest that, that people start to, to think about and, and maybe, maybe do. Um, great tips. Um, Shara, what is the best way for people to um, connect with you online? Sure. Um, well, lots of different ways. Probably the easiest is on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, so you can look for me there. And um, it's S-H-A-A-R-A-R-O-M-A-N is my first and last name. So you can look me up. I'm uh, very easy to find. Um, second would be my company website, which is um, the Silverine Group. And do you want me to spell that out or? I will include that in the show notes. And I apologize okay. if I did not say it correctly when I introduced okay. you. I apologize. Yeah. No. All great. So it's silveringgroup.com. And then if you're interested in learning more about the book and maybe doing a quick little culture quiz on your organization, you can hop over to the, the book website, which is just my first and last name, sashararoman.com, and you can learn more there. And um, I'm uh, on Twitter and Instagram, but not as active as I am on LinkedIn. All right. Shara, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today on this topic. And I very much appreciate the time we've spent together. Yeah, my pleasure, Allison. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to connect with you. Thank you. You too.